Hello and welcome to the CNC Talk Show. I'm here with Sam Duckett in Beijing and I'm joined by... Hi, I'm Mai Ping. Hi, I'm Lee. So the cinemas have been closed for quite a while, mm -hmm. but thankfully they're reopening in Beijing in low-risk parts of the country. Great. I feel like movies have played a big role in helping us get through the ongoing epidemic. And for me personally, I actually found myself watching quite a few Chinese movies during my extended period of time at home. Me too. Last night I just watched The Wandering Earth for the third time. Oh, really? <laughs> I loved that movie. And it's a great place to start our discussion today. Wandering Earth, directed by Guo Fan, was released in 2019. It's an epic Chinese sci-fi movie told yeah. in spectacular fashion, mm -hmm. big budget. Mm -hmm. And you could say the producers took a bit of a risk, yeah. but it paid off as this film became the center of global attention. Mm -hmm. mm, I love that film. It may be one of the most enjoyable Chinese sci-fi movie I've ever seen. I enjoyed it a lot too. And one thing that I loved about it was the contrast in storytelling in comparison to certain Western sci-fi oh. films. I mean, take Interstellar, for example, right? In that film, the plot is centered around a crisis on planet Earth, and they resolve this crisis by traveling somewhere far away and finding mm. a new home. Now, in Wandering Earth, similarly, there's also a crisis on the planet, yeah. but this time they're looking to stay on planet Earth and find a way to protect it. Exactly. I kind of saw this as embodiment of how Chinese people feel. To some extent, it might be different from our Western friends. For us, even if the sun was hurtling towards the planet Earth, I think many Chinese people would still want to stay and figure out how to protect the planet. And in Western sci-fi movies, the story is often based on Captain, we are ready for liftoff. <laughs> Films like Armageddon, <laughs> yeah. Interstellar, Mars, and so on. Yeah, and with Wandering Earth, they told a story with a very, I guess you could say, Chinese perspective. But Stu, everyone went to the cinema to watch it. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that one thing that I've noticed after living in Beijing for such a long period of time, and one thing that I'm very grateful to work with people like you guys, is mm -hmm. that with different backgrounds and different upbringings, it's unlikely that we're going to have the same perspective on a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. But that's not a bad thing. And I think that as Chinese movies become more popular, they provide a great platform for us to observe and appreciate these subtle cultural differences mm. and learn more about each other. Yeah, um, I think Wandering Earth is very promising because it broke $300 million box office in China, even beating out Marvel's Avengers Infinity War, which was also huge in China. And the thing is, you can't deny the popularity of sci-fi. This is a film genre that Chinese cinema needs to continue to focus on. Well, I personally believe that the popularity of sci-fi films hindered the growth of Chinese martial art movies in the West. Oh. I remember when I was a kid, my nan absolutely loved Bruce Lee. Wow. And she watched all of his films, and oh. I actually watched a couple with her when I was younger. But she did say to me that after the release of Star Wars, sci-fi was all the rage. Wait, was your grandmother a fan of Bruce Lee? Yeah, she really was. She loved oh. watching his movies back in the 1970s. Well, uh, I would like to say that it's not just your grandmother. Even now for Western audiences, mm. Kung Fu is still the first thing popping up when talking about Chinese movies. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, in the eyes of Hollywood, even pandas know Kung Fu, so what should we expect? <laughs> Ryan Lee King, Kung Fu Panda, everybody's Kung Fu fighting. <laughs> No, no, no. Back to sci-fi. Um, interest in space exploration and sci-fi has only continued to grow as we further establish our presence in space. Mm. And speaking of which, I am genuinely moved by Liu Yang. Uh, China's first female astronaut to leave the planet Earth. Yeah, and she has become uh, a symbol of encouragement for young girls across the country. And stories like her provide the perfect platform for Chinese filmmakers to take that brave step forward and continue to make epic sci-fi movies. Definitely, it's very, very inspirational for young generations like me. Well, like all of us. I guess. Mm -hmm. We are not included. <laughs> Don't tell him the truth. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is uh, normally the part of the show where we hit the streets of Beijing but today, we decided to do something a bit different, and we reached out to our foreign friends across the planet so that they could tell us about some of the Chinese movies that they've seen in the past. One recent Chinese film that I've seen is The Wandering Earth, which came out uh, last year in 2019, and I was so impressed by it. 
Uh, I think recently for me, most of the Chinese films I've seen have been dramas or martial arts films. This was completely different. This was um, essentially a sci-fi film set in the near future where the human race is trying to save itself uh, from the sun, which is going to destroy the earth. The plot itself is incredible. Um, and then the fact that it's been executed so well, the special effects are um, just fantastic. So I'm a, a great fan of science fiction so most of the stuff that you get here is going to be American or British so it was really refreshing to find something different and China does really good sci-fi especially in literature and novels and uh, if I had to have any criticisms I would say that probably the if you're going to spend so much money on creating this fabulous blockbuster film then maybe it's a good idea also to spend some money on good subtitles because I think that let the film down just a little bit. But um, no, more, more like that I think, more wandering out. So I'm gonna talk about the movie The Blade from Choi Ark. And I think this movie does two things very well. First off, it takes off the code of the Wu Sapien genre and like flips it on its head. And uh, the second thing they did very well was the directing because uh, they shot it almost like uh, a war movie. I mean, not even like a war documentary. It makes you feel like you were watching like something that could have happened. And usually, you can't say that with you know uh, medieval Chinese movie. So that's why I like this movie. So I've seen a few Chinese films before: Hitman, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Red Cliff. And I loved all three. The reason I loved them was because they do the big fight scenes really, really well. Sometimes when the camera pan, uh, pans out and you can see everything and you can see these huge armies ready for battle, I'll just never forget that. And I also think that the Kung Fu scenes are really interesting because they're more like dancing and it's a bit of fun. I just, uh, I just like it, really enjoy watching it. Wow. Impressive. I didn't expect that. Yeah, some of the movies they mentioned, I didn't even watch them. Yeah, I was pretty surprised as well. Let's take a step back and talk about how Chinese movies made their way into the West. Mm -hmm. You have Bruce Lee in the 1970s, who was hugely popular, as evidenced by my grandma. <laughs> And then after that, Chinese films became somewhat of a niche market. There were still people out there watching films made by Jet Li and Donnie Yen and Jackie Chan, mm -hmm. but they weren't enjoyed by the masses. Mm -hmm. And then in the 2000s, we have this landmark moment where you had the release of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, directed yeah. by Ang Lee. Mm -hmm. That was a Chinese story told through the eyes of Hollywood. Yeah, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon in particular grossed 128 US dollars in the United States, proving that um, our friends around the globe are really interested in Chinese stories. Yeah. But the question is, why are these stories so interesting? My personal belief is it comes down to the great source material that China has. I agree. Let's take uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe as an example. They have produced some of the most popular movies ever. And I think that in part is due to the rich source material they have, drawing from comic books dating as back as uh, 1961 and the truth is a lot of Chinese films also have very very rich source material I'm not sure if you guys have watched um, the Chinese TV series day and night back in it. 2017 mm. it was adapted from the novel of the same name telling a very interesting crime story with more than 4 billion views on Chinese a video platform Youku and it has even drawn attention from the US entertainment giant Netflix. Oh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. And there was also the film Better Days, which was adapted from best-selling novels. And it made a more than 21 million US dollars box office in China and made its way to the Berlin International Film Festival. But as a post-90s generation, I really want to give some credits to Chinese animations mm -hmm. because I literally grew up watching animations like um, The Monkey King, The Hulu Brothers. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is going to come somewhat as a surprise, but I actually love Chinese animations as well. Really? I just got through watching a, a Chinese animation called Yu and Jixia, which mm. is called The Outcast in English. And I remember a few years back when you had the release of Dash and Guilai. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that film so much that I actually recommended it to a lot of my friends in the United Kingdom. I am so surprised and so proud, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the thing is, I see China almost becoming industry leaders in terms of animation. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at some of the most prestigious Japanese animation countries on the planet, mm -hmm. like companies like Studio Perriot, for example. They're now working with people from China. And also, I'm a big fan of 
Japanese anime as well, just FYI. It's, if you look at those animations, the stories are often drawn from Chinese mythology. So you can see that China has a strong influence mm -hmm. on, for, on certain foreign animations as well. Oh, that's interesting because I believe there was a time when the animation industry in China was surprised by the success of foreign studios. But in recent years, I noticed some really, really big improvements. I'm really impressed by two movies, The White Snake and oh, yeah. Jia. They were both based mm. on Chinese folk legends and adaptation that kept up with the times. Yeah, and I remember that the three the animated film Nila Jia was also selected as China's entry at the 2020 Oscars. Mm. And one thing that I loved about that film was you had a lot, you had a character in it who was speaking in Sichuan dialect. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, in one of the animations that I recommended earlier on in the show, uh, Yi Ren Zhe Xia, mm -hmm. the main character in that also speaks in Sichuan dialect. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be honest, I know I shouldn't have a bias here, but I think Sichuan dialect might be the coolest dialect in China. It sounds <laughs> wow. so fun and interesting. <laughs> And it works so well in animated productions. Mm -hmm. So, and if I'm not mistaken, aren't you guys actually uh, partially from Sichuan? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. How about this? To give the audience a taste of what we're talking about, why don't we end today's show in Sichuan dialect? <gasps> wow. Are we going to do this? <laughs> never try, never know. Might as well give it a go. Why not? <laughs> okay, let's give it a try. Yisang就是今天我们节目的全部内容,谢谢你的收看。如果你喜欢我们的节目的话呢，不要忘了在节目的下方给我们留言哈。Okay. Oh, cheers! <laughs> I don't know how it. you guys yeah. felt, but I thought that sounded fantastic. And if you couldn't quite follow it, we hope you enjoyed today's show. And remember, if you want to leave us any feedback, please leave a comment below. Thank you. Goodbye.